take his men. Uh-huh. And that need to get out. Yeah. But MacArthur wouldn't let him out. You want me to finish the story sure. or he recorded? No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I don't want this recorded. Yeah. He said he's one of every one of seven officers that ever seen MacArthur that he shot him in the back. Yeah. <laughs> he said he left the Philippines, took all his personal furniture, all his personal mementos, yeah. and left three hundred nurses. Back around the circle then. All right. Okay, we're, um, we're now picking up um, the, the visual images here. Uh, this is Bill White, who, uh, well, your dad hires a truck driver and turned out to be the manager of the station. Well, right? he'd been singing on yeah. programs that, yeah. that around the station, and dad asked him if he wanted a full-time job. Yeah, and he did, and he turned out to be the manager. He turned out to manage the company. Yeah. Uh, Bob Weitzel. Bob Weitzel, he was just an announcer. And Chuck Cook was a sports announcer and announcer. Also a neighbor boy that was about the age of my youngest brother who died. Uh -huh. And he's <coughs> one of the few survivors from this experience. He's the one of the few people that was left alive out of that whole bunch. Mm -hmm. And they, had, those days they had a staff organist. Oh yeah, we had a staff organist, played piano and an organ. And here's Charlie Linehouse who sort of left you out at, uh, <laughs> where was it, doing the <laughs> basketball? Conrad doing the basketball. Charlie was, uh, Salesman and Charlie didn't show up for the he, game. <laughs> he got hurt. He got hurt in an automobile accident. Oh, he was in the hospital. <laughs> he was okay. And then again, your your friend uh, Eugene Peak. Yeah. A lot of memories there. Oh yes. Now let's. Here's some of the talent. Let's, let's get it. let's get this out of there. Yeah. yeah. And then take that off too. I don't need that. Yeah, that won't show up. We'll put it over here. Well, let's see. Why don't we? The Hensy brothers up there. Uh, let's start up there then. Two lads of harmony, right? Yeah, he was a uh, he's assistant bookkeeper for my dad, and he would. Uh, oh, he and his brother would sing every once in a while. They uh -huh. were from State Center. And they were on KFJB. They were on KFJB. And here's a group of. Uh, a group of sisters that used to sing. The uh, Haven Sisters? Haven Sisters, yeah. Okay. And here's Barbara's Bohemian hmm. Folk Band. And the, and Can't remember where they were from, Chelsea or Vining. And there's some place over there. In Tama County. In Tama County. <clears throat> they would come in every Sunday afternoon and put on about a three-hour program, and we'd have, they'd call in uh, requests. And they'd play for three hours, and we had three telephone operators, and it would take about one call a minute, <laughs> average. It was a popular uh, program. Well, the street would be out in front of the studio in the spring when we had the windows open, but we'd be parked solid for two blocks just listening to the band play. Yeah. Well, that's. And what is today is the 14th. 14th. Tomorrow used to be payday, but it isn't anymore because <laughs> you're anymore. retired. <laughs> that's right, not anymore. Uh, so that's Frosty Mitchell. If you don't know that voice, you haven't lived in Iowa until very recently. Uh, Forrest Mitchell, Frosty, broadcaster uh, and uh, broadcast owner. Been at it uh, quite a few years, Frosty. A long time. You know, it actually started back in about 1957, and it's been a love affair. But uh, you finally, you're at the point, now let me just do say that this is a Iowa Broadcasting History interview which we're doing on uh, July 14th, 1998 in uh, uh, Frosty's home in, in Grinnell, his uh, summer, spring and fall home and his winter home is where Iowa winters aren't, which is in Florida. Right. Um, you're, you are um, in, let, we're in Grinnell because the Grinnell sort of became the base of your, the ownership phase of your broadcasting career, which would have been around 1960, Frosty. February of 1960, mm -hmm. Grant, there's a little 152-foot steel tower, red and white, at the east edge of town that I want to go out and throw my arms around and hug uh -huh. every once in a while because it spawned an awful lot of good things for us. And that was KGRN, an, right. AM, an AM radio station. And back then it was known as a daytimer. A daytime. Uh, a daytime radio 500 station. 500 watts. 500 watts, and you were on uh, sun up till sundown. Uh, we then progressed to a 6 o'clock in the morning sign on, and mm -hmm. we really felt big time. Mm -hmm. And uh, now they, of course, daytime stations have low power uh, in the evening, so it's a full service radio mm -hmm. station. Mm -hmm. But a real hometown station. 
Yes, uh, it really is. We look for the, we look for lost dogs and cats, and gave the school lunch menus and the, the school buses and inclement weather and uh, yeah, just uh, uh, it, people just say, "What's the name of your format?" And I'd say, "Well, uh, we're hokey, <laughs> but localism, localism, yeah. real local, but genuine localism." Grant on on remember the old Associated Press teletype machines yeah. with a glass window mm -hmm. on every Mitchell broadcasting station on that glass window. It was a great big sign, signed by me, that says, does this story have a local angle? Mm -hmm. If it was a state story, national, international, does this story have a local angle? Because that's what your mission was. Any time that uh, our, our credo was keep it local. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We knew that NBC, CBS, a Mutual, they were going to do a good job, the rest of it, but keep it local. And when you did that, you served the community. Really did. And the community responded to us. Mm -hmm. And so it was a good marriage. Right. Well, let's take it from that point back now, and um, we're going to talk about, of course, your career has spanned a lot of play-by-play uh, -play broadcasting as well as management, and as you say, we finally got you off the air, what, two years ago? Two years ago. We finally made it after graduating from uh, uh, Radio School at Drake in 1955, uh, and uh, finally I could be in 1996. But actually, when you were at Drake, you were in radio uh, already, weren't you? I sure was, uh, Grant. Uh, my family, I was from Des Moines, mm -hmm. so I could live at home and afford to go to college if I had a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I did, was blessed uh, <coughs> that uh, uh, Jim Duncan was my professor, man who they named the track after. And yes. The, uh, old broadcast listeners remember the man that did the Hall of Fame on the girls' telecast. Mm -hmm. but Jim Duncan my professor. and. He got me a job as a disc jockey at KWDM, which is now KWKY, and from there I went to KIOA when it was a farm station. So actually, I, I thought it would be a leg up, uh, because by the time every all of us got out of school and went looking, I knew the first question was about uh, you know everybody you ever interviewed probably was well, what what's your background? Uh -huh. well, I had two years and two stations background, and I always thought that'd be a leg up, mm -hmm. and it was. And well, you you got you were in the trenches. There. I'm sure that when KWWL in Waterloo hired me, is because I had experience. Sure, right. So <coughs> when you graduated from Drake, excuse me, <coughs> you graduated from Drake in '55, and you got on with Blackhawk Broadcasting. Well, Blackhawk Broadcasting. KWWL KWWL in Waterloo. One hundred dollars a week. Uh huh. Well, I started at 18, but I started <laughs> earlier than you did. <laughs> but you were, you were an experienced broadcaster. Actually, you were, uh, I'm not, did they call you DJs in those days? Did right. They? We were, at that point, we were, we were disc jockeys, and uh, that was before the big breakout of, of rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, Elvis Presley came while I was uh, in Waterloo, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, when I, so uh, we, were, we were called disc jockeys. I followed a fellow named Ray Starr. Yes. He mm. was a legend uh, in the... It was not an easy guy to follow. He was a character, <clears throat> yes, to say the least. Yeah. Character might be better than legend. <laughs> well, I think he also was yeah. something of a legend, yeah. but he was good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. network quality guy, really. Yeah. He was. Yeah. Um, so you, the afternoon, you did an afternoon show. I did an afternoon show, and I'll tell you a couple other legends. That, as a rookie out of Drake University, yeah. not only following Ray Starr, I was head up against. Uh, uh, Charlie Trussell yeah. on KXEL, yeah. who was pretty well entrenched, and a guy named Byron Gosden, you bet. By Gosden. Yeah. And, and KOEL and Old Wine was the other factor radio station mm -hmm. at that time, and it was a guy named Joe uh, Patrick, uh -huh. uh, or Joe, uh, oh, I can't think George of Patrick. George Patrick, right. uh, who uh, then later on went to television. And uh, that was, those were heavyweight guys back yeah. uh, in broadcasting, because there weren't that many stations yeah. uh, mm. on, on the air. And KXEL <clears throat> was still... Um, was still the 50,000 watt radio station and, uh, and highly respected. Mm. And oddly enough, a, a big factor in our <coughs> Waterloo rating book was WMTAM out of Cedar Rapids mm -hmm. right. because the FMs weren't on yet. Right. Yeah. So you were, you were, and you wound up, and we'll talk about this as, uh, as an owner of WMT before you finally uh, hung up uh, your shingle on broadcasting. Well, if you can't whip them, join them. Gotta huh? get there. <laughs> uh, <coughs> So this was the period in which um, KWWL Radio was in the Russell Lamson building downtown, right. so that's where you did your radio show. We were on the mezzanine of the Russell Lamson Hotel. And that's where WMT was in, in the early, uh, early, early days. Uh, oddly enough, in the little broadcast booth where we did the disc jockey shows from, there was still <laughs> on the, one of the walls, still the call letters WMT, from when they had had a, a radio studio in that hotel. Right. Mm-hmm. 
uh, and your boss, uh, R.J. McElroy, was a WMT alumnus who uh, got his radio experience uh, on that station before he put KWVL on the air. And I've always felt that's why he called himself the voice of Northeast Iowa, mm -hmm. was because he came from the voice of Iowa. Right, and I yeah. think they might have thought they had that uh, voice of Iowa copyrighted. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Probably. <laughs> um, and again, you're talking about now a very unique chapter in the history of uh, media in Waterloo. You're doing radio out of this upstart radio station that McElroy started in 1947, mm -hmm. not quite 10 years later. Right. But by this time, he already owns the television station, which is in the building that KXEL built for television. Right. And, and you wound up in front of television then. We were doing pro using products that uh, uh, equipment was called Dumont yeah. uh, back then. Of course, it was only black and white. There was no videotape. Uh, in fact, we didn't have kinescope. Yeah. Uh, you go out and shoot film of a news or sport event and develop film with the time delay mm -hmm. uh, was was bad, you know, uh, on that. But uh, and, and of course, for that matter, you know, in our in our radio area, we were still using big uh, sixteen inch transcription discs yeah. and things like that. Right. But this TV studio was in the KXEL right. building, which is about uh, four miles out of town, mm -hmm. and so you did your afternoon radio show and then you hopped in your car and headed out Independence Avenue to the hill and uh, did a sports show on... When I put my closing theme on, I had <clears throat> about 45 minutes to get in the Russell Lambs, and back then they buried you in pancake makeup uh, because of mm. the bright lights, yeah. and, and when I, to get made up and get live on television, and there's no way to get in that hotel uh, uh, out to that TV without sweating John Deere or Raft Packing Company switching trains. <laughs> exactly. And, and you're, you're sitting there wondering what, what's happening out on the television side yeah. and you're watching train cars yeah. go by and, and switching. There was no way to get there without going over the tracks. They was, and they boxed you in every day. day. Had, many days. Yeah. You did sports then? Did, did sports there plus a, a disc jockey show on television on Saturday afternoon. On Saturday afternoon. It's called Frosty Swing Club and the kids from West and East High, there were only two schools in, or other schools out around would come mm -hmm. in and they'd dance on television uh, to, to phonograph records. And, uh, 78 you, RPM. Se yeah, 78. <laughs> uh, were you in the news block then? Did you do the 6 o'clock news? Well, yeah, every, everybody did uh, a, a lot of things. And because my background had been so varied uh, with news, sports, and music coming out of Des Moines, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, yeah, I, I did, I was a backup uh, television newsman. Fact is, I even did weather shows, and it's amazing to watch weather. We did them with flannel graphs, yeah. and clouds were pieces of cotton and things, <laughs> and to, to watch the, the high tech stuff now. Yeah. And nobody ever heard of Doppler. So you did, oh no. no, no. <laughs> you did a lot of different things on television then. I think I did about everything. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Probably not very well, but I did a lot well, of things. Good. It was get, but you were getting experience, yes. on camera experience, as well right. as on the air experience. And it was, uh, granted, and doing the commercials were live. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, and we also didn't have teleprompters. Uh, you know, back no. then you had, uh, we, had, we had called idiot cards, somebody standing off to the side. Yeah. But it was pretty hard to get an eye contact with the camera on those idiot cards. And occasionally the, the person doing it would maybe get them out of, out of sync. Mm -hmm. But the commercials were all live. And uh, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you made a mistake, uh, there wasn't any backup. You made a mistake. You made a mistake. Right. right. And, well, the, uh, we did baseball, Waterloo Whitehawk baseball, uh, Claire Rampton and I, and I was his backup on that. But we did, ba we did baseball with the Whitehawks on the road and us in the studio. We were not at the ball game. Okay, tell us about uh, that. When you'd recreate the game off of Telegraph yeah. and uh, uh, where you just, uh, uh, and it was a pretty good deal for me because uh, in the evenings I could do a three hour, we'd run behind. I could do a three-hour baseball game in maybe two hours and 20 minutes. The original to, video compression. You, on, on, on my show, the, the pitcher didn't take time to scratch or, or, or spit, you know, as fast as that te telegrapher was sending information. I was, you know, but occasionally, you know, you'd sweat bullets if all of a sudden you'd get, come up to it and it'd yeah. say, uh, telegraph down, uh, and yeah. now you've got to fill until telegraph is back. So you were doing Western Union recreations then as late as, uh, as the 50s. Mm -hmm. With a little block of wood. Yeah. for the sound, sound of the bat right. and, uh, uh, and some crowd noise uh, in, in the background. Well, that puts you right in up there with Ronald Reagan, you know. He started right. doing that at WHO. Uh, we, uh, he sure did. And, and, and uh, 
but we never set, uh, neither Claire Rampton nor I ever set the, the world's record for foul balls, as Ray, <laughs> Reagan did at uh, WHO when the telegraph went down. I think he had 27 straight foul balls, <laughs> which, and I think the major league record's 11 or something <laughs> like that. But, <laughs> but that was, uh, I guess I had, didn't realize that those recreations went, went that far into the radio it was, experience. It was the, called the Three I League yeah. at that time. Oh, yes. Iowa, yeah. Illinois, and Indiana. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did not, uh, now Claire went to Cedar Rapids, uh -huh. uh, but we didn't go on the road over into Illinois and Indiana. Right. Well, working for McElroy, you didn't do much traveling no, for anything. Right. <laughs> Tell us I, about working for RJ. Uh, mm. In fact, I used to accuse Mac of, of trying to figure out a way to use the, if there's some way he could reuse the, those little strips of teletype <laughs> tape that we, he'd make us roll them up at night if we would have figured out a way. But, uh, you know, Mac was, uh, uh, Mac was two people. Yeah. He was a, 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 a generous, uh, uh, fun guy to go pheasant hunting with, yeah. uh, you know, a, away from the broadcast. Fun guy and, and a, a dedicated. He was a bachelor till late in life, yeah. but really loved kids uh, or kids that need, needed a break. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, he was kind of like an athlete. This one person all of a sudden they step over the white lines and they take on, you yeah. know, and boom, he'd walk into that Russell Lamson Hotel and suddenly, uh, I always thought it was his old military background. So suddenly he was the commander yeah. and, 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 there were, and, and he treated, yeah. uh, you know, people that way. But on the other hand, Later on in years, as, as I got into the ownership side of it, I realized maybe there are days that he might have been sweating payrolls that I didn't think about. Yeah, and uh, because back then, there weren't a lot of people waiting in line to buy television advertising. And he was running on a pretty thin wire in those days. Oh, and, really thin. Yeah, right. And, uh, uh, but the benevolence of McElroy, his personality came out then upon on his death and how he had his estate set right. up that is still help, helping young people today and yeah. will forever. For a, it's just an incredible legacy. So that's really. the two sides of Michael right. McElroy that, that I saw. But but Mac was pretty tough on on employees and didn't keep them around very long. So Frosty oh. Mitchell was there two years, right? Two years, and we counted up. I think when I left, I came there with 37 people on the staff between radio and television, and I left two years later fifth in seniority, <laughs> and that was right behind uh, uh, the Ed Fox and Warren Meads and Don Inman and Mac. And Naoma McElhaney, uh, who were, were the, I'd really been there a long time. So you were right next to the upper echelon yeah. in terms of, but, of seniority, of service and, seniority. And, and some people that weren't mm. there long, but uh, Grant, some very talented people went through Waterloo Island. You just mentioned Ed Falk, yeah. premier talented. news director, yeah. uh, Warren Mead, a very talented and, right. and uh, wonderful person. Claire Rampton Claire was Rampton. a top-notch sports guy. Yeah. And, uh, but there were some real, real talented people that went through while I was there. Yeah, and you worked with uh, with some. You mentioned, in, uh, in fact, you showed me a picture of a man that I that I knew of and hadn't heard of. Tom Miller mm -hmm. was uh, was one of their early newscasters. Mm -hmm. So, do you remember some of the other on air people that you you worked oh, with? Oh gosh, uh, uh, Ralph Penza. Uh, Ralph who I, Penza. I yeah. now see uh, on the network uh, every once in a while. Yeah. Boy, right off hand, uh, trying to peg some of the people. But uh, uh, they were, but they were really going through there pretty yeah. fast. They, they were, yes, yeah, yeah right. they were. Well, that was a sort of an interlude in your experience, and from there you went to, you you left KWW like in and went fifty seven. Uh, uh, we went into uh, into Chicago. I, I freelanced uh, uh, for a while. We while I was in Waterloo for that two years, I uh, had some opportunities, and and we decided to go in and freelance uh, in the Chicago market. And it was an, an exciting uh, market, and uh, there were some great opportunities there, Grant. But uh, I can remember it well. Uh, my daughter, who's now uh, 40 uh, and running a radio station, uh, owns a radio station mm -hmm. in Harvard, Illinois. But the day that uh, Joan came home and said, I have some news for you, uh, <laughs> and uh, she said, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pregnant, and I said, well, then I have some news for you. Huh. We're going back to Iowa. Uh, this was not where I wanted to raise a family. Right. And, uh, uh, and we've never looked back. It was a uh, it was uh, a good decision. So you came back to Des Moines, and you were connect. You had a connection with KIOA. I was on my way. I was under contract to, to uh, KOIL in Omaha, uh, who had come in with uh, a fellow named Todd Stores, yeah. uh, whose dad owned the Stores Brewing Company. Rock and roll's coming. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, he had come up with a top forty yeah. format. Yeah. I stopped by. Uh, my folks still lived in Des Moines. I stopped by to see them on the way to Omaha as we were going to Omaha, and while I was in, in Des Moines, uh, ran across an old broadcast friend there who said this top 50 formula is going into the, uh, KIOA where I would used to work, 
and they talked to me, and I never got to Omaha. I forgot that. Uh, we put that, that formula in, mm. uh, and just took, uh, it was a rock and roll formula, and uh, uh, Jet News, and, and just went, uh, uh, just took the morning by storm. It was, that was the, the switch then to the music format, right. uh, radio, uh, the old radio format was was dead, television yeah. killed it. Right. And, and, and then came what we call the Nifty Top 50, yeah. five minutes of new, news alive at 55 mm -hmm. uh, in, in Des Moines, and uh, and we had, they had called the Big Five DJs uh, of uh, Des Moines, and uh, and we had Teen Hops at the Valor Ballroom, did the whole <laughs> enchilada, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a great experience. Uh, but, right. As a part of that experience, realizing that uh, it was not, I then decided I wanted to go into ownership. I wanted to okay. be, Mac, be McElroy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So that, <clears throat> you, but you were under contract to, uh, to KILA and you had an exclusion clause in your contract. We had, I had signed what then was legal, uh, a lifetime contract, and they gave me a very good contract. <clears throat> Obviously, you wouldn't sign it. Mm -hmm. uh, that I would not work uh, again within 50 miles uh, of Des Moines, and uh, looked good to me at, at the time. Uh, until we uh, then decided that we wanted to go um, long term, uh, being being a rock jock. And, and I've got to tell you, uh, Grant, I say this humbly, uh, the, how, how good to me it was. I very well then it was now it's Arbitron, uh, but then it was C.E. Hooper, mm -hmm. the Hooper ratings. Mm -hmm. you remember those? And I remember very well. Uh, the station breaks at KIOA. When I left, were uh, the Frosty Mitchell show more audience than all other Des Moines radio stations combined? Wow. You know, yeah. and people say, why? Yeah. Why are you taking this step back to go to a 500 watt daytimer? But we just really felt that that we wanted to get into the ownership side uh, at, in 1960, and um, uh, now where stations, uh, you know, the companies own 100 and 200 radio stations. Uh, uh, wanting to have a, a couple of stations, uh, you know, small market stations, was the quality of life that we wanted. Yeah. So, but in, in order to get, um, you had to get out of, you had to get out of that 50 mile radius. So you got one, one mile out of it. You they, tell me. They, <laughs> one mile. Grinnell, Iowa, then was on Highway Six, and um, instead of I-80, I've always been afraid to clock it. I'm not sure on <laughs> I-80 I if it was, but we were 51 miles away, according to. Uh, a young trial lawyer in Des Moines named Bob Ray. Robert Ray. He was of the lawyer, lawyer, and Ray firm, mm -hmm. and he, of course, he and I had known each other at Drake. And uh, this young lawyer thought that that Grinnell was far enough, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's where we were. So then there was a station for sale out there, mm -hmm. and so and you bought. Well, the, was it under those call letters at that KGRN, mm -hmm. which K simply means uh, <laughs> west of the Mississippi River, and mm -hmm. GRN meant Grinnell. Grinnell. Mm -hmm. So you took over ownership uh, under the. Uh, corporate name of the Mitchell Broadcasting, Mitchell Broadcasting Co Company. Uh -huh. It was our first station. Uh, then we built the station uh, Knoxville, KNIA, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that was an easy set of call letters: KN for Knoxville and IA for Iowa. Mm -hmm. And K just Knoxville happened to start with what was required by law west of the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, Bob Ray uh, became an, a, an ownership associate of yours then fairly early on in that company. Bob Ray, uh, mm. yeah, and, and for one good reason, after we bought the station uh, in, in Grinnell, uh, in Grant, when you see the price tags of, of broadcast stations uh, uh, today, uh, it's you know, no secret that we sold WMT for $14 million. Right. We bought the Grinnell, first one in Grinnell, for 65000 65, was for the yeah. Grinnell station a construction permit in Knoxville mm. and the accounts receivable uh, on on the Grinnell station. So that's how times have changed. But that was in that was in six nineteen sixty. That still was a pretty good buy. Yeah. And Bob Ray, uh, because I was broke at that after doing that, that took had mm. formed our corporation mm. and gotten it through the FCC, <coughs> and he took his legal <coughs> fees in stock. So he and Billy mm. became our only partners in that. Mm -hmm. And then Bob Ray did Iowa football with me. The first eight years of our football network, uh, Big Ten football, and was good at it. I didn't know that. Bob was excellent. He did color and statistics, and uh, <coughs> obviously you heard, you know Bob. I don't have to tell you, Bob yeah. Ray's fluent yeah. uh, and can talk. You know, and uh, so Bob Ray was a was a play-by-play -play color man. Then. He was the color man, stat man, and was e excellent at it. Uh, with one problem, we got in trouble one time. Was uh, Bob also did the halftime interviews, <laughs> and. Uh, 
Uh, I'm probably the only person that ever inter introduced Bob Ray as the pregame dope. <laughs> you know, well, here's the pregame dope. You know? but, uh, so, but he got me in trouble one time with a fellow named Forrest Eveshevsky. He was athletic director at the University of Iowa. And Evie came in to do the, the courtesy interview that you do for the stations mm -hmm. and whatnot. And Bob was a good interviewer, uh, but it was during the Eveshevsky Ray Nagel uh, hassle in the history of Iowa sports. Mm -hmm. Nagel being a football coach, Evie being an athletic director. Yeah. And Bob's doing the interview, and so he asked the obligatory question of Evie about, you know, about something in this. And Evie gave him, gave him the answer that most of we journalists would accept and move on to something else. Except Evie gave him the answer, and Bob said, did you or did you not? Cross-examined him. <laughs> His legal background jumped out, and he said, did you or did you not? You know, and suddenly, Evie said, Ooh, wow. You know, he, I mean, he, he, the trial lawyer came out of the interview, yeah. and Bob had an answer he wanted, and he went out. And then we laughed about that a lot of times. But the reason he quit me in 1968 is because of the primary. Yeah. We yeah. got an opinion from Washington Council that uh, not only our flagship station, but any stations we fed... Uh, that Bob Ray uh, was on that football game, they would have to give that time to a fellow named Donald Johnson from West yeah, Branch, right. Iowa, and a publisher named Bob Beck from Centerville, yeah. Iowa, who were in the primary Equal uh, time. With, mm. with, with Bob Ray. Mm. And uh, uh, so at that, that, that's where his football broadcasting career ended. I don't know whatever happened to him. <laughs> well, he, he did pretty well in that primary and several, yeah. several times after the, that. Matter of fact, I was his campaign manager mm. uh, back then, and uh, he lived through an airplane accident and won yeah. that primary, and then in the general defeated a fellow named Paul Franzenberg yeah. and uh, was the successor to Harold Hughes, and uh, of course, history takes it from there. You bet it, and it's yeah. a great piece of Iowa history, yeah. Bob Ray. And Bob Ray and Billy, mm. incidentally, yeah. uh, then owned the radio stations in Esterville, okay. AM, FM, and Esterville themselves, uh, without Mitchell Broadcasting, mm -hmm. uh, got a little advice, but not <laughs> okay. bit, and then and then we're into the WMT package later on. Okay, so they had a separate ownership from Mitchell Broadcasting. Yeah, that, that, that that had no connection to Mitchell Broadcasting mm -hmm. uh, at all. Okay, um, now <clears throat> you ran a hometown radio station. You did local news. You did, but Frosty Mitchell continued to do a show on the air. No, I I was uh, our news director. And, and I did the play-by-play -play sports okay. of all of the high schools around okay. and, and, uh, w and was our you news. You gave up the disc jockey business, right? Right. Uh, you know, and, and, and that's a, uh, a funny thing. And they were very kind uh, at the presentation of the IBA at the uh, Hall of Fame. Uh, Grant, uh, I, was, I was sportscaster of the year, I believe, three years. Uh, I was the only person in Iowa to ever be named by Variety magazine to, as a top 25 disc jockey in America mm -hmm. that year. Uh, and uh, in your business, the news business, back then they had the Associated Press had known as the Black Plaque Award. And uh, as news director at KGRN, I covered live a robbery in which a local policeman was shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for that, won this national AP award. And uh, the three biggest awards, uh, Sportscast of the Year and all these things, so they were kind enough to say that. So uh, we did touch all, all of the bases well, sure in did. addition to ownership. Yeah. And, uh, and if I had to do it again, I wouldn't do it any different. So you were, a, you were an owner news director then, sure. which is a pretty unusual combination. Yeah. The yeah. one place that I was a little bit thin was when it came time to, uh, to, to uh, broadcast the county fair stuff. Right? <laughs> and that's a part of small market radio, yeah. believe me. Yeah. But when you go out and start talking about the UEs and the heifers, yeah. Uh, the, the you, you missed a couple of the, breaths there. Yeah, the the, the, the yeah. farmers see through the guy that yeah. talking about the heifers and the UEs. <laughs> oh, you can't, you can't have all that background, but, uh, but yeah. beautiful, wonderful story. Listen, so um, now you you had these this group of stations, a small group, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and you were you've always been pretty interested in sports, and you and so you uh, you started a concept of of grouping these small stations into a network uh, to do uh, big time sports, Iowa football. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, Grant, you know, kind of an osmosis process. We had Grinnell, then we had Knoxville, then we had Mount Pleasant, Bob stations at Esterville, and we were feeding this football to ourselves. Yeah. And some other small market broadcasters around said, gee, you're doing a good job, and as long as you're, by telephone wires back then, yeah. as long as you're feeding this out to your four or five stations, could you feed us? Mm -hmm. And and it grew to 30, uh, 30 stations. And it wasn't really by design, but it turned out to be a great service to the University of Iowa yeah. uh, because uh, WHO and Jim Zabel, they were big, and yeah. WMT with Tate 
and Ron Gonder and the other people, they, they were big, yeah. but uh, the little market people from, gosh, we had Lamars and, and from way out, yeah. uh, the, the Crestons and the Atlantics and these people, uh, it gave them an access to what we call big time, Big Ten football. Right. And, uh, but it wasn't by design. We were feeding our own, and you know how you get friends in this industry, and you guys said, oh, uh, the first guy was a fellow named Cecil Hamilton from Clinton, Iowa, mm -hmm. who said, well, couldn't, couldn't you feed me as long as you've got this format? Sure. Yeah. The, but it really was, and that is a concept, of course, then that was picked up in a number of, uh, of, uh, of other places. Suddenly, it got pretty competitive, because we'd grown to 30 stations, and then other people, uh, Learfield organization came to the state, uh, hooked in with Bob Brooks and KHAK, and, and they, they became very good. Uh, but syndicating programs was their business. Yeah, right. uh, they became very, very good at it. And then uh, at the end of the, uh, before Iowa went exclusive, Palmer had a little network of their, put a network together too, mm -hmm. of many of our former affiliates, uh, incidentally. Uh, and, and so there were actually three networks, but it had gotten expensive. Yeah. You, you needed to have some help. Right. But it didn't start out that way. Right. The franchising yeah. costs on it became right. uh, bigger and bigger. The university sort of found there was a little pot of gold at the end of right. that rainbow, didn't they? Yeah, but they sure did. Mm -hmm. a, big, a big pot of gold. <laughs> right. But you really loved doing that, though, didn't you? Uh, Grant, I, yeah, I did. Uh, you know, that was my maybe, you know, I, I love the, the local station concept. And uh, believe me, if there's such a thing as radio reincarnation, mm -hmm. I'm coming back as a small market broadcaster <laughs> uh, once again. Uh, but, but once a year, uh, through the television of the Iowa Boys and Girls State Tournament, I had statewide exposure and got some of the ham on my system, and then the football network in the fall, and, th and that, that really satisfied something. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, you mentioned something there that, again, that as you, a lot of people knew you as the, uh, as the color man on those uh, Boys and Girls uh, basketball games. Well, the state tournament games. It was quite a run, uh, Grant. We had 17 years of live television uh, on the girls' tournaments for Wayne Cooley, and I think it was 15 years uh, for the IBA on uh, the boys' tournaments. And it was uh, it, it was a great run. And again, uh, timing being what it was, uh, I was a disc jockey when the rock and roll came in, and disc jockeys were hot. Well, we put uh, and like the Iowa Television Network. I was the first three years of that. Uh, now there's how much basketball any given night do you want to see on yeah, cable. Right. But back then, uh, the turn of state tournaments were happening on television. There wasn't basketball on television. Exactly. Uh, nor when uh, Carnaby Square put the, Iowa, the package together in Iowa. So I was the right guy at the right time. Yeah. Uh, and, and, that, and that was a big, big event in Iowa. So you were, you were in, I didn't remember, you were involved in the Iowa early Iowa Television Network experience? Yes, uh, with Carnaby Square, mm -hmm. uh, Bill Bolster uh, put that all together, uh, yeah. Bob Hogue. Uh, and uh, and myself, I was uh, finally replaced by Sharm Sherman. Oh, so you you were Sharm's predecessor on right. that. That I should have remembered that. But but, uh, uh, but so you really uh, you that was those yeah. were the, for the era of people. That was the Lute Olson era. Yeah, in right. There, and it was it was a great time. It, it hasn't been any better than that. That has was it? great. No, yeah, we were at the final four. It was wonderful. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, but <clears throat> did you? How much how much sleep did you get at night? You must well, about four hours maybe. Well, that was one of the problems, and of course, uh, my lovely wife Joan kept reminding me, uh, Frosty. We came to Grinnell in 1960, <laughs> and our goal was to get you off the air, and you're going to become a broadcast executive. Yeah. And uh, here I was, probably I was re really more involved. But during the basketball season, uh, yeah, it did get get very very uh, uh, busy, uh, but. Uh, Busy, I always thrived on. But because you didn't do, a, you didn't recreate them on Western Union. No, sir. <laughs> right. no, it, and uh, it's, it seems funny, uh, uh, Grant, now th that that ever happened. Yeah. But uh, you know there were better ball games. Believe me, w the nights that I recreated, I did a better ball game than the nights I was at White Hawk doing it live. Because yeah. it was all coming out of your head. I mean, I, I, I mean, the facts were coming it, from Western Union, but you were putting the story about. When it. I did a Western Union game, Grant. I can't ever remember having a center fielder camp under the ball and pound his glove and catch a can of corn. <laughs> he went all the way to the ball and he leaped. <laughs> <laughs> <Never. laughs> you remember, remember, the, remember pre-television, you, yeah. you never saw a bad fight on radio, did yeah, you? Right. <laughs> on Friday night fights <laughs> yeah. before television. Yeah. Guys, those guys went toe-to-toe -to -toe for 12 rounds, didn't they? Just banging away, <laughs> yeah. Well, now you're, um, you, you, were, you sat under the umbrella of that, well, you sat under that WHO umbrella oh, for... Yeah for all of your experience, that mm -hmm. big voice of Iowa. Mm -hmm. And then you worked in 
for McElroy up in northeast Iowa where right. WMT was king. Mm -hmm. And now we're down the road about, what, 30 years? And, and you're looking, and, uh, and all of a sudden you're, you're sitting in the, in the manager's chair over at, uh, over at WMT. You know, and that was quite a cycle. It wasn't all of a sudden, you know, it, sure. it, was, it was quite a cycle, you know, to go around because we had had so much success in small market radio. And I always felt that, that uh, I could make it in, 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 the little, in the little bigger market, the mm -hmm. competitive market, but you didn't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always wondered about that. And uh, so many of the ideas, because uh, Cedar Rapids is a, is a nice metropolitan area, so is Waterloo, so is Dumont. But Cedar Rapids is still, uh, those are Iowa people. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I felt some of the things that we did would, would work there. And, you know, I probably knew more about WMT by being their competitor than some of the people that work there. Mm -hmm. Because I studied our yeah. competition yeah. Uh, and scouted them, and they're on my push buttons all the time. So I, I, it wasn't exactly a walking into a virgin forest. Right. I, I knew WMT and, and uh, uh, the, their product pretty well. So you and your... I uh, didn't know their FM product. Uh, which was a bit of a challenge. Yeah, that, that was different. And also because the music was changing. Yeah, all the, as I right. was getting older, uh, the music was changing. Right. Uh, on the, on the, and the FM was, prim was primarily music. Yeah. But my type of radio was AM radio. And uh, and I knew that product. You bet. So you and Bob was Bob Ray was associated with you in in that ownership. Yeah, that was a great adventure. It began I, in the mid '80s. I, I, see, I had uh, I was out of uh, not there. Bob Ray lived in Cedar Rapids as president right. of Life Investors mm -hmm. after he finished being governor. Mm -hmm. He was he was actually one in Cedar Rapids that found out about WMT because mm -hmm. he and Bill lived in Cedar Rapids. Right. He was president of Life Investors, uh, which is now the Agon Company. And so Bob was 20%, Billy was 20%, my wife Joan was 20 I was, and the employees were 20% uh, when the, all that, that went together. And you ran that the station then from the mid-80s up to about the mid-90s, about 10 about years. About 86 uh, up through maybe 95, I guess. Right. Five. And at that point, um, you, uh, you made a decision. Uh, it's sort of a, a benchmark decision in your, in your career. That, well, it was prompted somewhat by age, uh, uh, Grant. There were two things, I saw two things coming. One, I knew the University of Iowa was gonna go exclusive, and I knew the revenue, what, what that would mean to WMT to uh -huh. take that revenue out of there, and then, because by then we'd hooked our network onto WMT. Yeah. I saw that coming, and I also saw the deregulation fires going in Washington, D.C., and it took a little while to get to Iowa, but anybody was napping that didn't see it, it got here uh, <clears throat> happening on the East Coast and, and West Coast and uh, the deep pockets and 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 broadcasting changed yeah. uh, Grant, you know who am I to say that it changed for the worse uh, from my viewpoint I, I think it did but uh, but uh, suddenly uh, programs were coming off of the, the satellites we had 65 people in a radio station at WMT uh, a news operation that was uh, was we didn't look at net profit in the right. news and information side, uh, and and a great farm department, yeah. uh, our own meteorologists on a radio stations yeah. and this kind of things that aren't, aren't there anymore. Well, uh, suddenly programs are coming off of uh, uh, off of satellites and uh, the hard disk uh, computerized things with nobody even in radio stations at certain hours of the yeah. day, and uh, I could see that coming. Mm -hmm. And the combination of that. Uh, and, and the University of Iowa were going to go to an exclusive on their sports. I just didn't, and my age, and it just seemed like the right time. Yeah. So you decided to um, to get to to sell. It was, it was time time to sell. We either had to get big or get out. Yeah. And we elected because of and age. A lot of people had out. to make that decision. You bet they right. did. And, and, I, and I, I'm sorry to say that I have a feeling that in the annals of Iowa broadcasting that. Uh, the Mitchells, uh, families aren't going to own the WMTs anymore. No, no. Never again. The price tags are up there, and uh, but it's going to be which corporation owns it. Right. And, uh, uh, and corporations are going to own it until they've taken all the depreciation out of it. Then they're going to, like hotels do, they're going to yeah. sell it to another broadcast corporation. Uh, who will really milk it dry. Who will start <laughs> the depreciation clock all over again. Yeah. And Because depreciation is cash to the accountant, yeah. and when the depreciation is gone, that's the only way these deals apply. Yeah. So you sold it to a company where you thought it would have a good home, Palmer Broadcasting. That breaks my heart. We looked around uh, for, for a while and turned down some offers that were frankly better than the one we picked. 
but I'd met with a, a gentleman named Joe Lenz, who was uh, at that time uh, in charge of Palmer Broadcasting. And That's knew, the WHO, WOC company. WHO, uh, and, uh, at, and uh, at, we certainly felt that uh, Palmer had been here forever, and, yeah. and the three didn't have any idea that the three sisters were, were, going, were going to sell out. Uh, they did at a very nice profit, but Joe Lenz was sincere, and we sat down and negotiated because here was people people that they believed in agriculture, they believed in the, the AM radio. They uh, invented it. <laughs> yeah, it was was so big and 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 was so good. To them. They they believed in all of the things that we believed in, yeah. plus taking care of your people. Because you know, uh, uh, I'm not going to say people got rich working at WMT or WHO, but they sure had security right. once they were there, and and they, and they were good broadcasting. And the, the package just fit together like a glove under the re new regulations of the FCC. And my, one of my big regrets, and I'm sure Joe Lenz's big regrets, is the fact that Iowa never got a chance to see synergetically what WMT and WHO hooked together, news, ag, sports, on the information side, yeah. uh, could have meant. Right. Uh, I, I, Grant, right offhand, cannot think of another state in the whole union where two AM radio stations could have provided the service uh, to, to a state like that could have happened. And I don't think there is any place in Iowa. Right. But they ended up uh, under the stewardship of the JCOR Corporation. And their concept of uh, their stockholder owned and uh, they're, of course, from out of state. And, and their concept of, of, of radio and, and ours are, are so different right. uh, that, uh, you know, they, they have to look at the bottom line. They have to look at earnings. Uh, and uh, it's the new... It's the new wave of uh, it's, yeah. um, it's it's rating points and rating points and the ad agency wants to they buy the stations that have the numbers and how do you get numbers well you, some things that we didn't want to do right well that's uh, a very you you've been you've certainly been at at a lot of junction points in you in the relatively short span of your career which yeah we had, and had great opportunities many times uh, that. To, to do other things or offers, you know, to go strictly the talent side in larger markets and yeah. do things, but uh, we 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 love the the small market. Uh, we we felt I feel good. That, uh, the last time we counted it up, uh, uh, Grant, uh, fourteen people that went through Mitchell Broadcasting are the licensees of sixty-seven radio stations. That's interesting. Which includes our own kids. And well, talk 14. about that now. So here you spawned a generation, another generation of radio station owners. You and your and your wife, Joan. Well, and there are people that uh, learned. They used to say uh, uh, in the uh, mm. in fact one year there was an IBA convention for fun. They uh, they were going to have uh, they had three rooms in this one session, and you can uh, so on small market radio, and uh, you could uh, you could go in and learn the right way. The wrong way or the Mitchell way, <laughs> and uh, that was always uh, we, we did things that were different. But sometimes we brought a, a little bit bigger idea to the smaller market because yeah. I'd been in Waterloo right. and I'd been in Des Moines, and and we were students of it, and yeah. and so we did bring some some things. Uh, a little 500 watt daytime station in Grinnell, Iowa, was the first radio station in Iowa to have what a Marty in it. Yeah, which That's a two way radio. Two way radio yeah. for news for for On live spot, right? live news was the first station in Iowa. It was the first station in Iowa to have cartridge system, which was designed by Collins Radio in mm -hmm. Cedar Rapids, and we had it first. Mm -hmm. We were their 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 trial balloon station, uh, you know, on that. So uh, uh, we were we were one to be state of the art in the small market. Right. And now you're you have three of your children who are in in radio Two management ownership. Three. Two of our three. Two. Uh, Grant, they always uh, at one time the third daughter uh, was in our sales department uh, here in Grinnell when we owned the station. And then uh, two of the daughters uh, own radio stations uh, in here in Powhatan County. They say no Mitchell ever had a real job, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but the kids have done well. They're good broadcasters, uh, and uh, I they still believe in what we call real radio mm -hmm. uh, people. Uh, they you walk into one of their radio stations at any hour of the day, there is a live operator on the control board. Mm -hmm. They answer the phones. Uh, they they uh, uh, the, if the uh, fire siren goes off within five minutes. Everybody in town will know where the fire is. Yeah. And uh, still uh, doing so local radio. That's right. They are doing 
uh, our localism, and, and they're at the county fairs, and they're live. And but they learn not to say he for and you. Yeah, that's right. They, 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 <laughs> they're a little more sophisticated uh, from, 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 you made that from that up, standpoint. Frosty, but that's okay. You no, that, that story. No, Grant, that, that, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm a guy that laughs at my own mistakes because I've, <laughs> I've made a <laughs> lot of them, you know, and uh, a lot of them. Yeah, well, that's terrific. Well, Jason, why don't you pull back and you know, take get a shot of this wall here? We won't. There's there's a lot of um, a lot of your accomplishments and experience represented up there on on the plaques that are up there. But let's just talk a little bit about some of them. You were uh, you mentioned the um, the Iowa Broadcasters has honored you with about all the honors they can give one person. But you also gave a lot to that organization. You headed it up for a while as president. I, yes, it was, a, it was a, four years through the chairs of the IBA were mm -hmm. probably the most rewarding. First of all, uh, administrative assistant at the time was uh, named fellow named Jack Shelley. That's quite who, a guy. Who mm -hmm. I could call and learn from at any time, uh, and because uh, 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 he'd been there and back. And, and uh, so going through the chairs of, of that, I, I really uh, gained a lot. Uh, and I'll never forget the year that we got to put the convention on. My family at uh, Lake Okoboja, which the president usually does, uh, and we had Vince Wazalewski out, who was head of the NEB at that time, and we had a pretty all-star cast mm -hmm. uh, for the, but it was a great experience uh, of, of that. Uh, and, and the organization was just, uh, whether you went to Washington, D.C. to lobby with them, uh, uh, I'm president of the fan club when it comes to IBA, yeah. uh, long live IBA. Mm -hmm. Well, and you've had the privilege of crossing paths with uh, the giants like Bill Corton and oh, in, the, in, the, in your associations. And you know, Bill Quarton uh, was so kind because uh, after we, when we came back to WMT, a matter of fact, at that time, we made a big issue out of we're bringing the license back to Iowa. Mm -hmm. there, uh, since Bill Quarton uh, had uh, gone out, there had been two other ownerships. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'd known Bill for a long time. And, uh, you know, having worked for Michael McElroy and just being an associate of Bill Quarton, but Bill, uh, uh, you know, he said, I, I, but we'd been there maybe six months when uh, he came, uh, he'd come back from Florida and he was in town and, and he came into the office and sat down and, and he said, I want to thank you. Is that right? Well, that meant a lot. That really meant a lot to you, didn't it? Right. He realized that, that uh, our goals were kind of what he had in mind. And then uh, uh, later on when he found out we were trying to rehook KWMT, uh, which the FCC had forced him to divest mm -hmm. them, uh, you know, back together. And, uh, uh, and of course, you know, uh, well, he, at one time, Channel 2 was WMT TV, right. and uh, uh, so uh, he had put together a wonderful package uh, for Iowa, but his heart, uh, as he's proven, has been with Iowa Broadcasting. Right, and he's, I consider him one of the great visionaries of broadcasting, oh. period, not just in Iowa. Of course, he headed the, you know. Aren't we all grateful for the Bill Quartons and the people that formed the NAB and, and, and did, did and lobbied Congress, uh, you know, and whatnot? Uh, it must be tough. Uh, and for, for some of those, those guys now, I, I re react a little bit to the current rules of the FCC, uh, and uh, it must be tough on them too. Yeah. Well, and he brought, but this concept that you've pretty much dedicated your life to, which is local service, was, I mean, that was his hallmark. I mean, that was the mark that he put on, on the stations that he was responsible oh, for. Oh, my golly, the, the Dean Lanfears and the people that I got to know uh, over the years that, that were there and what they believed in uh, and how strongly you know they, they believed in and the, the local creation things that they yeah. did uh, on, on WMT. Right, yeah. yeah. Well, it makes, it, you can, certainly we can look back with pride if we're not too comfortable with what's, you and I share some views on what's going on in broadcasting in this year of 1998. Mm. One of the things, uh, Grant, that also disappoints me a little bit is uh, so many things in business or in life are cyclical. And you can see the cycle going around, but not this one. You don't see this one. I, I don't think that the... Well, economically, it can't come no, around. Once you can't. get locked into this no. kind of leverage, where can you go? No. Even if the FCC and the government ever got to the point where they said, hey, we got to go back to where these stations all have to satisfy a public need with yeah. a different format or a different niche, uh, big business, it cannot happen mm -hmm. uh, now because it's too big. But I can tell you, I can drive from my home in Stewart, Florida, when we come back to Iowa, uh, for that half of the year, 
and I can drive across the country and you'd think I never left. The, every town, it's like McDonald's and yeah. Wendy's. That's every right. town has some of every format coming mm -hmm. off of the same satellite right. uh, with just a little different local liner now and if then. It's not J-Corps, it's Chancellor or? Yes, it's Clear Channel, mm -hmm. uh, that, that they're, it's out there and they all, they all sound alike. Right. And that's the way it's being run today. You bet. Well, we aren't going to be able to turn it around, but it's wonderful to reminisce about the, the road that uh, you and I have uh, shared, which is pretty much parallels. I was, I was, in the, I was across the wall in that KXEL that's building right. when you were coming out there to do television for, uh, for McElroy, of course. And you know, but Grant, it's like so many things in life that competition makes business better. Yeah. You go into these markets and there's not competition. Yeah. There is one station that calls themselves News Talk. Yeah. Well, you know, it used to be uh, that, that when you were at, at KXCL and you had a great news department and a farm department, we tried to have, but if there was a news story, we kind of raced each other to get there. You betcha. And we wanted to be better and, and, and the most accurate. Now, you don't have to be first and you don't even have to be accurate. And that's no. the part that scares mm. me. Because there's, you're the only one that's doing yeah, it. You mm. don't have to be accurate. Right. And that's the part. That, that bothers me maybe, maybe the most. Yeah. And the other side is that we, you know, is with the exclusivity in, in collegiate sports and professional sports is that I call it wallet journalism. Yeah. The, the ball clubs or the universities own the announcers yeah. and don't think for a minute they don't control the announcers. And so if journalism is, is criticism or, or opinion, well, and at one time, boy, did the university Or even just straight objectivity. <laughs> right, that's right. And that's the thing that Bump Elliott always said when he was athletic director. He said, we have the best of all worlds right here. He said, the, the Jim Zabel, the Tate Cummins, the Frost, they're, all the broadcasts are different. They all have, you know, they all have their followings, and, and the listener had a choice. Yeah, right. Well, you just mentioned some names there again. Tate Cummins. Mm. What respect I have for that man. Not, not as a great sportscaster, incidentally. But a great human being. Great, that's it. Great person. Humanitarian would be my word right. uh, for the tater, and uh, uh, and uh, you know that he knew sports, but he oh, was yeah. I yeah, mean, he, but he, I know, but, but if the average, if somebody driving across yeah, the country, right. uh, I've, I've always nowhere said, else but in Eastern Iowa could Tate have gotten away with oh, that. Uh, you know, if I always said somebody coming across I eighty and the seeker on their button moved yeah. over, and here came Tate Cummins, uh, and people say, what on earth, you know? But yet he was so deep, he was so warm. Uh, and uh, what Tate Cummins did for a project called Camp Courageous yeah. over at Monticello, Iowa, and, and his wife, uh, Dottie, uh, my respect for Tate Cummins is far bigger than as a sports announcer. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. That's lives. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. People loved him. They mm. literally loved the guy. I was on a United Airlines flight <laughs> years and years ago when they used to fly very low altitude coming from Chicago to Des Moines. I mean, 30 years ago mm -hmm. uh, or so. And the pilot came on the intercom and said, you're going to see something uh, unique as we left Dubuque. He said, uh, in about five minutes, look out your windows and you're going to see, uh, watch the farm lights go off. Huh. Tate Cummins is signing off. <laughs> and I looked, out the, I looked out the window at 1030, apparently Channel 2 or something, or whatever it was, and I looked out the window and the guy was right. Yeah. You'd see lights, people actually stayed up because of Tate. He had a, he had a Sportscast was over at 10.30 until uh -huh. Iowa goes to bed. That's right, in Eastern Iowa. <laughs> yeah, really. Well, it'd be wonderful to spend the whole afternoon chatting with you, but uh, what, what's, uh, as you look back over this, um, any one thing that just jumps out as, obviously you've, you've really appreciated all of it, uh, but uh, any one thing? You know, unique things happen uh, the other day, uh, uh, Grant, I was at uh, a place and uh, talking to uh, Terry Anderson, who was the golf coach, is the golf coach at the University of Iowa, and we were standing there talking, and a little kid came by and said to his mother, Mother, that's the voice of Adventureland. <laughs> okay. Terry Anderson looked at me and said, you did, you did 400 Big Ten football games, <laughs> and you're known as the voice of Adventureland. Well, that ties in with, you know, I... I have got uh, a lot of awards. We mentioned Broadcaster of the Year, uh, Hall of Fame this, Hall of Fame that, and this kind of thing. But Grant, I've also got memories of little kids on the phone calling me uh, at KGRN in Grinnell, Iowa to say, thank you for finding my puppy. Yeah. I wouldn't trade all of those plaques 
all of his awards. That's terrific. That's, that's just, it. That's great. Frosty, thank you. <clears throat> that's just great. That's terrific. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> well, you got uh, you got a lot of good years ahead of you too. When, well, when, we hope so. Uh, you know, we uh, we just uh, we we're not going to rusty. Yep. All right. Okay, well, we're, um, we're starting the tape again now, and we're going to take some uh, uh, video copies of some photographs that uh, Frosty has in his collection. Uh, this is one that goes back to the uh, KWWL TV experience. This would have been in that studio out in the KXEL building, Frosty, and election, election returns. A primary election of 1956, Okay. and primaries were in June mm -hmm. uh, back then. Uh, holding the phone, that's a prop. I was actually not on the phone. Uh, that was a fake. Tom Miller, uh, he was holding a microphone, which uh, you'll notice at that time, rather large, but that was the lavalier mic okay. of, of, that, of that particular era. And as you can tell, the letters were hand cutouts uh, on the WWL there uh, and, and a paste up. Uh, on, that was on a piece of felt, as I, as I recall, uh, much as you used in your old Sunday school lessons, mm -hmm. like the teachers mm -hmm. used. It was felt, and uh, as, as you can tell, there's no high tech to that at all. Uh, we we're just pasting numbers up. And that was uh, the only thing that you had to work with then. That, that was and the names there are Hickenlooper and uh, Irby and... H.R. Uh, Gross H.R. Gross. That district uh, at that time were probably the most... Uh, Irby was governor, Hickenlooper was senator, and Gross was the third district congress. Right, right. and uh, places in history for all three of those. Exactly. And uh, what's Frosty Mitchell's role here? Do we're uh, doing uh, commentary? Well, or? yeah. at, at that particular time, uh, I... Uh, actually was a disc jockey on radio, but on television I backed up news, news people. I didn't have a big staff. I backed up uh, sportscaster Claire Rampton. I backed up Tom Miller on news, and I backed up Ray Lane uh, on weather. Okay. Uh, so uh, on that night, of course, uh, as any news director would say, all hands on deck, I, they had me out there doing that. And you were an, um, you were an on-air person. Right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> now let's uh, switch over or pull back and push into the to the man on the other side then, Jason. <clears throat> that, is, uh, that is Tom Miller, who was at that time one of the primary uh, news anchors on Channel 7. Right, he, he was uh, the 10 o'clock and the 6 o'clock uh, at both times, and a very talented, uh, that talented person. When he was mm -hmm. on, he was good. Mm -hmm. And he was, on, he was on for several years. As yes, was he was there quite, quite a while. Mm -hmm. Okay, well there's some, uh, some visual history of uh, KWWL. And here's some more, and this is a different, uh, Frosty Mitchell wearing a different hat. <clears throat> um, but again, this was, this was kind of, what's the, the guy who did this on network? He's still do Dick Clark. Dick Clark. Mm -hmm. This was the KWWL version of the, of the Dick, Dick Clark show, right? Right. Uh, and, and that was Did you do it, bef you did it before, didn't you? Uh, it was, uh, yes. Uh, we, got, we got the show from a fellow named Jim Lounsbury at WGN in Chicago. And uh, everybody thought the network show was going to be the Lounsbury show out of Chicago, and it was a pretty big surprise when something originates out of Philadelphia, uh -huh. as Clark did. And uh, mm. but so that that was uh, that, but that happens to be in the very same part of the studio uh, where the election results were uh, a moment ago. If you, you know, the, there's a different set mm. that they ran out there. I think they also had wrestling in there. Yes, <laughs> you remember uh, wrestling. And if you look under mm. the cam, the big old black and white Dumont camera, it said KWWL. Under there, that was known as an idiot card. Mm -hmm. That had the notes uh, for me, the MC, uh, on the. But obviously, Mr. McElroy didn't give us clean cardboard. Uh, that was on the back of. <laughs> Wrote on both sides. Uh, back on some, something else, uh, and that that was uh, for the live commercial or whatever it was. That but was, the concept here was the kids came in and danced in the studio. Right, and and uh, you played records. Played records and uh, uh, the pop tunes of the day. Why don't you push on in? And this that's the uh, that's the nineteen. Mid 1950s uh, image of uh, of our guest today. Right, you were starting down that road there. Mm -hmm. That was a, uh, that was a lot of fun. It would get hot in there. If you imagine those kids yeah. dancing with those uh, those studio lights for television, it got warm in there in the afternoon, yeah. Saturday afternoons. Mm -hmm. Early television. Yes, it was. That would be about three years after they, within the third year after they went on the air. It hadn't been long. Yeah. Um, again, you're wearing your music hat here uh, um, with the KWWL microphone uh, doing an interview with a... And as you can see, radio then in 19, probably 56, the fellow's name was Sam Donahue. Mm -hmm. He was a saxophone player, brought his orchestra into Electric Park uh, Ballroom. And uh, uh, as you can see, 
uh, the microphone at that time was just almost like a stage public address microphone that That's we used for the old mic. Shures. Mm -hmm. Right, the yeah. old Shure microphone. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to, just for the fun of it, well, <clears throat> I'll have some fun with some people on this one. <clears throat> this, was a, this is a guess who I would never have guessed, so let's just look at it for a second before Frosty tells us uh, who these personalities are. <clears throat> Frosty's in the middle. We've already got him identified. But uh, let's start with the man on the right, Frosty, and then why don't you just push right. in, Jason? The, the man on the right, uh, is he just uh, passed away in uh, the year uh, 1998, uh, the late Carl Perkins. And at the time of that picture taken, he was the biggest name uh, in the group. Uh, Carl Perkins had just written uh, a song called Blue Suede Shoes, which Elvis Presley brought back a couple of years later even bigger, but uh, Carl Perkins uh, was the artist uh, on, he'd been a country artist and he'd made the crossover to rock mm -hmm. uh, and his song, uh, Blue Suede Shoes, uh, and, and I'm holding uh, a top 50 sheet or something like that, we're looking at his record being number one in the country. So he had his own version of Blue Suede Shoes before uh, Elvis made it. On an yeah. old label called the Sun label, mm -hmm. and uh, then later on Elvis came and put a new beat to it and it really got big. Yeah. Well, now let's uh, go over to the left-hand side of the picture and uh, see how you do on that one. We give people a clue. That's one of the few times you'll ever see him not dressed in black. Okay. <laughs> now he's giving it away. <laughs> and his name's not Gary Player. How's that? <laughs> you have to look, look at the eyes and you look at it. and uh, Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. And at that time, he was a backup singer to Carl Perkins. Amazing. Back up to Carl Perkins. He was there as a backup singer to Carl so Perkins. So why were they in Waterloo? Was this in Waterloo, Frosty? Uh, it was, I, I think I had a show out at Electric Park okay. uh, uh, Ballroom, and, uh, and they were the part of it. And at the time, we got lucky because the time we booked Carl Perkins on the show uh, out there, uh, I'm sure Bob Benner had no idea that he'd had the number one record. Uh, <laughs> they'd rather have been in New York City at yeah. that time, but, uh, but they, they were there they were. Okay, well, they're interesting, uh, very interesting uh, photograph. And then and certainly it takes us back a few years, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, now you, we've talked in the interview about your KIOA experience, and this is just uh, this is one, one example. And there, again, there's, uh, you're doing, interviewing little league players there. Right. If you just notice the age of the mobile news unit, that kind of <laughs> tells you that it was the, the yeah. late 50s. Uh, and that's when uh, all radio stations, I think, are on 24 hours a day anymore, but mm -hmm. KIOA was the exception. We were 24 hours a day. And you were a and big a wide signal station. It was right. pretty good dial position. 10,000 watts daytime, uh, 5,000 watts night uh, at 940, and mm -hmm. it, it kicked a pretty good signal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where, this is when you'd now been, you'd left KWWL, went, tried to, decided you didn't want to raise your family in Chicago. Uh -huh. You're back at KIOA where you really put, uh, Again, where Top 40 radio was, was coming into it, force. 19. It just swept across America, and, and uh, I had to be the right guy at the right time. Well, you were the right guy at the right time in quite a few places. You know, it's funny, Grant, uh, you, know, you don't realize it now, but because uh, everybody works there a few hours a day and, and, and they want to go home. But back then, a privilege to me, uh, you know, I had both drive times in Des Moines. Uh -huh. I took people to work 6 o'clock in the morning till, uh, uh, till 9 and I came back in the afternoons four till six. I took them to work and I took them back home. You were. Uh, and uh, if you try to hire a, a personality today to, <laughs> to work a split shift, uh, it wouldn't work. But, uh, but I, I thought it was a real privilege. A lot of times have changed, haven't oh, they? Oh, haven't they? Yeah, they sure have. Well, thanks for sharing these.